They're coming to get you, Barbara. I ain't one to make a fuss about a thing like that. Make your wishes. They're coming for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Deep Cuts of Horror. If you're new here, my name's Dylan. I'm Jacob. And I'm Martha. Okay, well, we got that. <laughs> Start <laughs> over. Uh, my thing was, did I say Deep Cuts of Horror? So this week, as promised, we have a very special uh, several episodes for you. We are going to today be discussing our first of a three-part series where we're going to be discussing Stephen King's Rose Red, released in 2001, airing on the ABC network. And guys, I think I speak for everyone in this room when I talk about how exciting I am just for this moment. You are very exciting, Dylan. I, I'm just very excited for that. I'm at a little behind the scenes thing for everybody involved. Um, I sent out an email to Martha and Jacob to talk about this movie. And I mentioned a Joyce Reardon level obsession with this movie. And that cannot be understated. This is, this is pretty much my thesis for the show. Like if I uh, if we if we recorded these episodes, published them, and I died the next day, I could go at peace, just so that the whole world has a six-hour commentary on how much I fucking love Rose Red. Perhaps we should open the floor so everybody can get introduced with just a quick little introduction question. Jacob, can you tell us and tell the audience and the listeners what your first experience was with Rose Red, or better yet, probably to give us first what was your first experience with Stephen King? leading to Rose Red. Okay, so my first experience with Rose Red was probably around the time that it came out, which I believe was 2002, is that right? Uh, 2001. I think it was late 2001. 2001, 2002. And at that time, I was only around five or six years old, so I saw it, but I didn't really understand it. It's one of those memories that just kind of sits behind a vague (laughs) curtain in the back of your (laughs) mind where you you have sort of halfway access to it. But it may be what inspired my love of uh, gigantic haunted house horror. That is my absolute favorite genre of horror, like Rose Red, Haunting of Hill House, uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion, I'll take it if I have to, and even the (laughs) Scooby-Doo Night of a Hundred Frights video game that also came out in 2002. I love it. I eat that shit up. Now, as for my first experience with Stephen King... I honestly don't remember. It was probably one of these early miniseries. Maybe It, uh, the original miniseries It. I I have very early memories of the... Yes, with Tim Curry in the library with all the balloons. Uh, I love love, uh, that scene. I love Tim Curry. Oh, it's great. So, Martha, what about you? I'm going to redirect that question right back at you. So, I'll start off talking about my first, like, real introduction to Stephen King, just because it's a little bit more to talk about with that. I I guess it would probably be one of my first times experiencing Stephen King firsthand, because I have this very distinct memory. It kind of traumatized me. And this summertime, I was at the trailer park, um, hanging out with the trailer park kids, and so it was really hot, so we went inside. And their mom put on a movie. Guess what movie it was? It was It, you know, Stephen King's It. <laughs> um, Part one in the VHS. Yes. And uh, the, I didn't, I wouldn't get in the shower for like weeks after that because I was so scared of him coming out of the faucets or like it just, it absolutely traumatized me. And then it turned out that my mom was a really big Stephen King fan because when she would broke her hip when she was 25 and she was in the hospital, like not hospital, she was in the nursing home, her mom brought her um, Stephen King books to read. So she really, really liked Stephen King. So after I started talking about it, then she started buying VHSs of other Stephen King, like miniseries and stuff like that. Cause we didn't have cable. So all we had was either VHS or DVD players. And then my first experience with Rose Red was when I was about 15, 16, when we finally could afford to get cable. I was all about on Saturdays watching the different marath- like movie marathons that Sci-Fi Network would have. And there was one weekend they were doing a Stephen King miniseries like marathon. And it was like one o'clock in the morning and Rose Red comes on. And I was just absolutely enamored by Rose Red to the point that I had to watch it again. Because I couldn't watch all of it because it was so long and it was already like one o'clock in the morning. I went to start a TV and appliance. <laughs> 
and thankfully Carlos had it on VHS. <laughs> so I still had a VHS player. I still have a working VHS player because I've always had VHSs. And so I rented it and watched it on the two pack VHS when I was like 16. Um, <laughs> just so I could fully experience Rose Red, and it's been an obsession ever since. I spent years trying to find a decent priced DVD copy. Finally, eventually, at some point in my adulthood, Amanda gifted me one. So I was just obsessed with Rose Red for like the longest time, because I don't know, I think for me it's more the characters. All the characters are so interesting and different, and have different plot lines to them and I want to know what happened to the characters so definitely always had a had a deep obsession and I'm actually really excited to have a discussion with other people about Rose Red because no one knows about Rose Red so I'm really excited to talk about it because I just really loved it it's very similar you you guys both brought up it the miniseries which I think is very funny because in in the back of my head rewatching this first part I think the reason that I love it so much is almost the same reason I love the original it miniseries it's not so much the effects it's not so much the story it's the characters for some reason, these char- the characters in the It miniseries and the characters in this really stick with you. There's something palpable about that camaraderie, I guess you could say that they have with each other, but also the vividness with which the characters are presented. What what would you say to that, Jacob? That is one of the things that I was really uh, feeling when I started rewatching Rose Red, is all of the characters are so likable in my opinion at least and they all have their own stories i mean Mm -hmm. they're some of them are mean some of them are very snarky some of them are actively trying to undermine each other but i like every single one of them joyce despite how obsessed she is to a reckless degree is trying to undergo scientific discoveries and she's fighting for what she believes in in her in a department that that des- despises her uh you, you see um i forget the, the gentleman's name the one who sees uh ghosts emory emory yes his plight with his mother and dealing <laughs> with her overbearing nature and trying to get money like all all of these characters i just love so much and especially the psychic i love every time he opens his mouth I probably cheated a little bit because I wanted to see what the modern consensus of this was. And I looked up a lot of modern reviews versus original reviews. They were pretty much the same in that a lot of people didn't enjoy it. Variety magazine uh, ha- had an art, a particularly scathing article about this movie and everything in it just basically tore it apart. Uh, said it was a Stephen King greatest hits, but not in a good way, which I can kind of get. There are a lot of borrowed elements from other work in this one, and that might partially be because whenever this came out or when it was in development, Stephen King had had a car accident, and the only way he could cope with the recovering was to throw himself into his work, and this happened to be on his lap at the time. So I think I think that's one thing to mention, but I can also see some of the modern reviews that just chalk it down to a poor special effects slow log of a production but i i now hear the same thing from people who come into the it mini series for the first time as a, as adults instead of watching it as kids for me i wasn't really focused on the scares i wasn't focused on the scary clown for me it was these characters it always felt like a more mature goonies that was three and a half hours long is pretty much what I got out of it. And you kind of you kind of get this sense feeling that these characters in Rose Red are are the driving force of the story. Really, the background that is Rose Red the house and the backstories we get are really just a backdrop for these characters to just interact and just wonder what they're going to do with this space. Exactly. And to to talk about why modern reviews are probably like they are. I feel like a lot of people forget that with Stephen King he writes his screenplays very much like he writes his novels. Novels are more character driven because mm-hmm. you don't have a visual. You have to use characters, plot mm-hmm. devices, things to push your story along in a format that's really imaginative that you can see. But when you take that and you translate mm-hmm. that into like a screenplay or something and you have to make it real, that puts limitations and mm-hmm. stuff on, like that that weren't there before. So <laughs> he's a novelist. He creates stories the same way even when he does it with a screenplay. So a lot of the times his ambitions for what he wants to do doesn't translate as well on screen and a lot of people forget that 
And that's where they fall into that trap of it's not as enjoyable to watch because it's not as pretty. The effects aren't as good. But the story itself is always phenomenal. I'm glad that you bring up that he writes his screenplays like novels because uh, I mentioned that I watched Rose Red when I was fairly young for, for the first time. And from that moment, like, until I watched it again, I assumed that Rose Red was a novel that it was a Stephen King novel that had been adapted into a miniseries. Mm-hmm. And I was very surprised when I learned that it wasn't, that there is no, like, full Rose Red book that this is based on. And correct me if I'm wrong, but but I just thought that was so strange because as I watch this film, or this miniseries, whatever you want to call it, I can feel the adaptation from book to screen. Like, mm-hmm. I can feel these scenes being chapters. I can see where the line breaks would be. It's mm-hmm. it's so amazing to me that like you can see how this novel writer is writing a screenplay as a book. He's compared multiple times that he prefers miniseries over films because you don't have to pack everything in the suitcase. That's kind of his analogy for it. So he sees miniseries more as televised movies. And I 100% agree with that. Now, perhaps we should get into this, or well, actually, perhaps maybe I should get into my first uh, Stephen King experience before we get way too off the rails with it. Pretty much my first Stephen King experience. You really couldn't say I got a whole lot out of it, but when I was about to, I have this vivid memory of my mom. It was late at night. She was watching the original 1970-something Salem's Lot. That was on TV at the time, and I had woken up from bed to come out there for whatever reason to the living room, uh, like little kids do, and I ended up watching it with her. And I, I distinctly remember it giving me, like, my first nightmare. And being the child that I was, as precocious as I am now, I'm very self-aware of what I am and who I am. I'm like, mark this down, Dylan. This is your first nightmare. Because I think at some point there, I had had something where I was watching something where someone had a nightmare and I was like, I've never had a nightmare before at two years old. And when I had that, I was like, mental check that because this is important and people don't remember their dreams. So how cool is it going to be when you're going to be able to tell them that you had your first nightmare. And it was a dream of the scene where Mark Petrie is at the window and he's like scratching. There's all this fog. He's all vampired out with these weird eyes and fangs and just scratching to be let in the window. I had a dream of like his head. It was giant. It was huge, almost like something out of the Scary Stories Tell Out of the Dark book, which I wouldn't discover till many years later. And it was eating my mom. Makes you feel better. My first nightmare was also a vampire, but all they did was lick my cheek. I was five. I distinctly remember it. Like, that was my first nightmare, too. I, w- I was going to ask that, by the way, if if you remembered your first nightmare as well, because so do I. And I think it's cool that all three of us do. Mine was, uh, I was at my dad's apartment in Morristown, I believe. And uh, the troll from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, like mm-hmm. that terrible CGI troll, I dreamed that he was banging on the front door with his club while somebody was in the bedroom playing the Moonlight Sonata. <laughs> and I heard this like narr- narration, like somebody was narrating my life, say, he's coming for you and he will not stop until he finds you. And, like, it would scare me so bad. Like, I would wake up crying, and I would ask my dad, are you playing Beethoven? And he would say, "Uh, Jacob, we don't have a piano. Uh, And I I actually found out, like, many years later that the neighbors were constantly drunk and fighting and getting into, like, domestic disputes. And so that's probably the banging that I was hearing. Yeah, or it was just a different type of banging. Yeah, I think my, uh, my dream about vampires just came from my mom watching Queen of the Damned, my birth mom watching Queen of the Damned a lot. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, because for whatever reason, for a five-year-old child, I feel like my vampire nightmare was hypersexualized. My intro to Rose Red was, I believe we rented it from Sparta TV and Appliance as well. I'd be really interested, Martha, if we could just both go into Sparta TV and Appliance together and just pick all the movies that me and you collectively watched, and which ones we couldn't watch that week because the other one had rented it out. I wonder how many times that did happen, truthfully. Rose Red was on the list. Rose Red made the list, but we watched it, and we all really enjoyed it. And I was that kid when it came to weird or creepy stuff. I'd watch it, and I'd be like, ooh, that was scary. And I'd have nightmares about it. I'd see the actress Deanna Petrie, who we see in the second episode, and Sukina with, like, their red glowing eyes, all skinny and gaunt, just staring out my window. And I'd be like, ooh. But then I'd be like, 
I want to watch it again. And I, I'm still that way. If something really scares me, I'm like, ooh, I got to watch it again. If only, I guess, is some weird way to take the fear away from it. Because really, the fear is the unknown. And usually at the second to third viewing, you're seeing stuff that you might have missed that was a bit more hokey. And I'll admit, the effects in this don't hold up as well as I'd like to. The practical effects... I, I'd say are pretty good. It's just where the computer-generated stuff comes in that's a little uh, shaky. The effect that comes to my mind as the only one that takes me out of it is when uh, John is flung from the tower, and we cut to this scene of him falling and screaming to this like awful grainy background. I don't. They really just should have cut that. I think. It's so funny because this movie was actually over budget. They originally had, I think it was a $12 million budget and they went to like 35. Now, most of that went to promotional material because this is a very analog spiritual successor to the Blair Witch Project and that Stephen King loved what they did so much when making a website pretending it was a real thing that he did the same thing with this. They made a fake documentary about Ellen Rimbauer and the house rose red the oil tycoon everything basically a more formal more of a um unsolved mysteries type thing that was essentially the college history we get in this movie when they're discussing the building of the house and everything that happened with her and the whole thing is basically framed like Joyce Reardon, who is a talking head in the production. It's not the Nancy Travis, the actress, playing her. It's someone else. But Joyce Reardon is a talking head there, and I believe so is Steve Rimbauer as well. And they're talking about how they're going to, going to go on this expedition. So basically, this was like a, this is what happened next. And they also released a book of the diary of... Ellen Rimbauer, which was in the universe of the story was found at an estate cell. And there's a foreword by Joyce Reardon, the main character here, and uh, Steve as well. But it wasn't actually written by Stephen King. It was written by a different author under Disney's company called Hyperion or Hyperion, same people that did Percy Jackson and the Olympians. They have that as well, and I actually have the book and read it, and it, it's kind of a slog. Uh, Stephen King didn't even approve anything. He apparently just read the first couple pages and was like, I like where you're going with it. Keep it up. And Stephen King just gave this author just the bare essentials of what the history was and to make everything kind of work around that. I have not read The Diary of Ellen Rimbauer, so I don't know the experience that you had. But in fairness, it doesn't need to be good or a page turner if it's meant to be real, right? Like it's meant to be someone's real diary. So that could possibly work to its advantage. Yeah, it lost me about the time they start hiding in the attic from the Nazis and That was um that was In Seattle. <laughs> Anne's diary. <laughs> Dylan, that's the wrong diary. She's not much of an author, I'll give you that. <laughs> I did think they did a really good job animating Hitler in this miniseries, though. I, I found that he was very intimidating, and he looked a lot like the real one. So that's what we're going to do now. This is just going to be a Diary of Anne Frank <laughs> discussion. What movie did you guys watch? <laughs> <laughs> one thing I kind of want to bring up, though, uh, a lot of reviews did call this a slog when it first came out, and I thought... I could kind of see where they were going with it because it's an hour and a half and the first hour and a half of this is very much information in the universe that's world building, which is great. But if we're in a situation where you got to watch it one night with commercials and then tune in another night for the second half and then a third night, I can see how you probably wouldn't be appealed with it. My question is, do you guys think it would have been better as a streaming show if it were to come out later? A hundred percent. I think it would have done really, really well if it was on a streaming platform. Because then people could stop and take breaks and watch the next episode when they were, like, ready to within, like, a couple of hours or within a couple of days as opposed to having to wait, like, a whole week. And then what if there is a point in time in those weeks that they're dropping the episodes that you have to do something that night? You miss it. And it's not like you could come back and watch it again, so therefore you lose interest in it and you don't want to watch the next episode. So if it's streaming... And you could immediately watch the next part if you wanted to. That makes it, I feel like, more accessible to a wider audience. 
because then it's on their time. They can watch it when they want to. I definitely agree that it would have been more successful as a, on a streaming platform. I don't think there's any question of that. But I don't personally have a problem with the way that it was done. Uh, I love really long movies, like like three, three and a half, four hour movies. I really appreciate that. I mean, it's irritating when you watch them in the theater because you usually have to get up to go use the restroom or something. But I hate what you referred to, Dylan, as packing everything into a suitcase. That's more Stephen King's terminology to describe making a movie versus a miniseries. But, but it's the truth. I mean, you have to pack so much stuff into a movie. To be perfectly honest, I don't think it's good as a storytelling medium. And so having a miniseries like this, I think is just so much better. I love having an hour and a half of just the build up to going into the house. It makes it feel so much more real to me. Oh yeah, and probably one of the more successful examples of how this could work is the Mike Flanagan series is on Netflix, where you have The Haunting of Hill House, Bly Manor, and Midnight Mass. Those three really scratch the same itch that this did when it first came out and still does. And they're both very talky, very exposition heavy, very slow going into it and into a gradual build up. I just think that for the general Bob and Sue who were watching this, there wasn't enough in parts of it to keep people coming back, especially people who are probably more casual Stephen King fans. Bob and Sue are assholes. Going into this movie, one of the things that appealed it to me to put it on the show, and one reason I wanted to justify it, was that, uh, and Martha, I believe you said it a little bit earlier or alluded to it, it doesn't have a physical or digital release, which is very criminal. You can, you can dog this movie all you want, which I don't want to overstate that because I do think it's quite good in what it is. I really enjoy it and think it is worth a watch. Spoilers for the end of the episode, I guess. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say it's deep, but there is no f current physical or digital release of this. Anywhere you go to buy it, you will be purchasing it used and used copies if you go on Amazon, are running about 50 to $60. Yeah, we ran into that one the first time I come and visit you in like 2021. We, ran, we went to that one store, and they had a copy mm -hmm. of it, but they were only charging like 40 bucks for it. I, it took, like, I almost told them that they needed to charge us more for it. I was like, I almost did, but then I, I didn't, you know, but I almost kind of mm -hmm. wanted to tell them they needed to charge more for it. Because just seeing one in the store like that, it just, it doesn't happen. You could chalk it up again to it not being popular with people, but you can't say it's because it's not good. There are plenty of Stephen King movies out there that are just dog shit adaptations, and they still have a ongoing media release in some form or other. Even as a combo, like Storm of the Century, not saying it's bad, I really enjoy it as well. But it's a combo with five other disaster films. Even the, probably you call the B-roll or the Phase 5 of the Stephen King Extended Universe movies. They all have a release together. Your Secret Windows, your Sleepwalkers, your Apt Pupil Stand By Me, those movies that are le lesser appreciated and aren't considered the high canon of King Lore still have a media release, and this doesn't. Do you want to elaborate on that, Jacob? The only elaboration that I have is to say that I think it's criminally disappointing that that is the case. When I think of Rose Red, I, I view it as the quintessential big haunted mansion horror movie. I can't think of any other movie, and maybe it's my own ignorance, but I cannot think of any other movie that fills that niche quite so well. I mean, yeah, there are the original 7,000 adaptations of Haunting of Hill House. Uh, Which this is one of. Is, which this is one of, some of which include Owen Wilson, which was a mistake. But I, I can't think of any of them that uh, that live up to Rose Red. I mean, some of the new Netflix series that we talked about, like, uh, again, The Haunting of Hill House or The Haunting of Bly Manor, I think they come close. But to me, Rose Red is, is still the best, or at the very least, it's the classic. And the idea that Maximum Overdrive is still floating around out there, but Rose Red isn't? Oh, it's I, I don't shit. understand. Horse shit. I, and I don't understand why it wasn't so popular either. I mean, something, the name itself, as simple as it is, I mean, roses being red, that's like the most cliche poetic phrase you can think of, but it just sends like shivers of mystery through me. 
One thing I see about reviews and retrospectives that no one really brings up about this. Think of the time this movie came out. This came out in 2001. Yeah, late hours. 2001. And historically, horror movies kind of took a backseat for a long time. And especially this movie involves a lot of scenes of like rocks hitting buildings, that stuff falling out of the sky and striking structures. I could see how initially this could get buried just because that's something that the American public just doesn't want to view in their homes at that time. Annie Wheaton definitely got investigated yeah. by, some, by the, some shadowy government organization, <laughs> I, I guarantee it. Yeah, in Stephen King world, it's called The Shop. So my sister wants all that money. They were throwing boulders against steel beams to see how much force it took. Mm -hmm. And George Bush just stayed in that classroom. Which that that is a fair point. I mean, when when horrifying things happen in real life, uh, horror movies definitely tend to take a back seat. I mean, that's true for most genres. Like when people are worried about the future, sci-fi becomes less popular and fantasy becomes more popular, and and mm -hmm. vice versa. So, I, it may have just been poor timing. Well, it does create, whenever bad stuff happens in the world, it does create a sort of a lull in the horror genre. But then at the tail end of that, you get really reflective art about it. I'm not saying, you know, um, right after the Twin Towers went down, we had a lot more horror movies about buildings getting destroyed. But you had a lot of homeland horror and... Uh, xenophobic horror movies like hostel movies like saw that's when we kind of went into our torture porn era hostel especially that movie made me not want to travel to another country ever and movies like house of a thousand corpses made me not want to travel down the back roads at all I love horror movies that, regardless of their quality as films, genuinely make you afraid. I think the Final Destination series did a good job at that. Like, even if you hated those movies, you still probably don't drive behind a log truck anymore. Yeah, Final Destination's a good example of a shitty a movie bed. with real-world effects in how people view things. Because no one can argue that the Final Destination movies are great films now you can say they're good horror movies but no one's gonna say it's a great film but all someone has to do is watch one final destination movie and i guarantee you there's gonna be a different way they do stuff i mean just look at how jaws affected sharks and like people's view on sharks because there wasn't that stigma or fear before jaws was there not no it's, it's a very well documented thing that there was not the stigma around shark attacks before jaws and over the years, it's been proven that great white sharks, bull sharks, are like way more aggressive than they are, and it's just a, now it's known knowledge that you know if they're gonna bite you, it's because they think you might be a seal or something. Like they're not out to eat everybody. Yeah, and before <laughs> Carnival of Souls, no one was afraid of white men. Oh God, no, that's no. That, no, no, <laughs> not, there was something better. It, it that was one of those things I said. And it rolled around in my head, and on the first pass, it sounded great. But on the follow-up, when it came out of my mouth, I heard it, and no. I, I want to retract that statement. <laughs> it's already out there, man. So, well, so he I, I wasn't expecting was just it. incorrect. I thought it was on purpose. I was going to go with it. Yeah, I, I didn't expect us to talk about the World Trade Center in our Rose Red review, but I saw, like, only <laughs> yesterday night, this, like, 1980s, computer graphics tutorial that was showing people how to do like graphic design uh and the tutorial that they gave was how to remove the world trade center from the skyline no yeah yeah and i was sitting there like wow that aged really um interestingly that aged about as well as this movie uh i don't know what that means i mean the special <laughs> effects let's just say the special effects because okay okay i i I personally don't care about special effects. No, I want, again. I want a good story with good characters, and that's why I like Yeah, good that's characters. literally it with me. I, I was always that person, not to take it back to it, but here we go. People would watch it and say, oh, it's so funny. The special effects are so stupid. I laughed at it. <laughs> and I'm like, then you miss the whole point of the movie. Congratulations. It's about the characters, it's about the camaraderie, it's about the friendship, it's about the time in your life. 
Uh, same as this one. It's about these connections these people are making. It's about the connection to the house. It's about the history. It's about the world building. And I'll go ahead, hot take right now. My interest in the history of Rose Red and the little world building they did spark the same niche reaction that I had whenever I first saw Titanic and how into just Titanic history I was right after seeing that movie. And don't lie, I know everybody in this on this episode went through a weird obsession with the Titanic. Uh, I, I watched certainly. Titanic and while I, mean, I was in the womb. Yeah, the, your mom told me about that. Definitely had went under that same obsession. Um, and for whatever reason, I think that's the main reason why I wanted to watch Rose Red again was because I was just so enamored by just the first part and just meeting all those characters and the lore built it like it is. And so much time is poured into just being able to present the background of this house and why the significance of them going and why the people that are going are going and meeting the characters and having that that basically like a character flush and, and a world bending like world building um, episode and because of that is why I probably got so hooked into it too because I'm very much like both of you I'm I don't really care about the effects that much in fact I prefer practical effects that don't really look the best anyways I think it's more fun I'm always more of like a heavy like I like the characters I like the world building I like you know how well they you know portray the story as a whole that that's mm-hmm. for me I'm more about the journey not the destination. No, probably one of the things that really rekindled my interest in this, because it's always been a favorite of mine. It's always been in the back of my head. But one thing that really brought to the forefront was one day I saw an ad on Facebook for the Airbnb or bed and breakfast Thornwood Castle, which is in Washington. And it's the house they used for Rose Red. And I was like, oh my God. Because I, I knew it wasn't real. I, I got that far and was really disappointed. It was like figuring out Santa wasn't real. Sorry to anyone listening under the age of 17. The fuck Or are you Santa about? knowing age. <laughs> Why do I keep getting I presents? I one of those kids. We'll talk about it later, <laughs> Jacob. We've got a lot of ground to cover. I, I think it's hardly important we focus on one little thing. Yeah, and <laughs> Santa's got a lot of ground to cover when he gives kids to boys and girls every fucking night. You don't see me saying he isn't real. This man works Did hard. Did you say when Santa gives kids to boys and girls every night? I probably did. <laughs> I become Southern when I get when I get fired up. <laughs> oh, he gets fired up. I do too. I think we all do. That's that's kind of the problem. I've noticed that with the episodes <laughs> when we get really excited about something, we get really southern. Uh, you need to watch Krampus. <laughs> Krampus okay. is real. Santa's not real. Krampus is real. Initially, this whole project was supposed to be the dream mashup between Steven Spielberg and Stephen King. They were going to make this movie together. But because they had different, differing opinions, and after Stephen King's car accident, uh, the project just kind of went back to Stephen King, and he decided to develop it himself. And then Amblin developed the movie The Haunting, which was more akin to St- Steven Spielberg's vision for the movie. And in my mind, there's no... There's no real contest which is the better one. I know The Haunting is more well-known, and you can actually watch it on a digital release with Catherine Zeta-Jones and one of the Wilsons. Basically, if you want a better version of The Haunting besides this movie, go watch Scary Movie 2. Yeah, honestly, That's Scary fair. Movie 2 is another good example of this genre of horror. and I hate to even bring up that franchise, but you're right on the money. You know... Uh, you, we keep bringing up that Stephen King was in a car accident. He was hit by a bus, is what happened, if I remember correctly. Can you imagine how amazing it would be if his next story was about a guy who gets hit by a bus and then goes and kills the the person who hit him? Like, can you imagine? <laughs> Red misery. <laughs> yeah. What's more amazing? I don't know how much King you guys have read, but Stephen King is a character in the Dark Tower series. He's a character in the Dark Tower series, and um the guy that hit him with a vehicle was an agent or somehow under the influence of randall flag the main antagonist of the series but also um of the stand 
it's fun. It's kind of funny his catharsis in in dealing with that and deciding that that person was inherently a villain and in the wrong. Like he just tried to hit Stephen King. But besides that, I think we should. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to say about just the I guess surroundings of this movie before we just dive right into it? Well, we kind of moved on from this a while ago, so maybe it's not worth it to bring up again, but. The documentary that they made where they were Mm -hmm. pretending that Rose Red was real, Mm -hmm. I adored the fact that they got different actors to act Mm -hmm. like the real versions. Because anytime you watch... Uh, like a uh, the real story behind mm-hmm. a, a horror a horror movie, especially if you watch like those really shitty like Discovery Channel horror things, like 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 a Paranormal Witness or whatever. You'll have the actors in the dramatic reenactment, and then you have the real people telling the story, and they don't look anything alike, but you can still tell why the actors were cast to play them, right? Like there's a there's kind of an aesthetic resemblance there. Seeing a fake Joyce pretending to be a real Joyce who has that exact same relationship with the actress who plays Joyce. Something about that just, I fell in love. I was like, wow, they got this spot on. And Steven as well. Like, it really felt exactly like one of those uh, those paranormal documentary shows. I 100% agree. That was, honestly, the, that made me think this whole thing was real. And I didn't notice, I didn't find out it wasn't real until I saw the lady who's doing the other Joyce in another property. She was in another movie or something. But also, I I don't think we can understate how there there's another popular horror franchise that does the same thing. I believe it was American Horror Story season five or six. It was Roanoke. Roanoke, yeah. yeah, Where they have actors, well, they have actors playing real people and then having other actors portraying the reenactment of what happened. They're all there. Yeah, and I I think that's really cool and something that Stephen King doesn't get enough credit for because that that all kind of came together like that just as well. And uh, if this got a better release, I would like to see that more prominently featured on special features. Yeah, I fell asleep during the special features last night. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Martha, what did you think of the our our little prologue that we get to open the story about Annie and uh, sister? I think it was extremely wise of them to go ahead and start off with building up Annie's character in the way that they did, because she is such a vital plot point. Her story and her character development is what pushes a lot of the plot along. Her character is very much like a a focal point for the character, so all of them have relationships with her, feelings about her, and they're all various and different so she certainly also helps with the character development while the other ones so i think establishing her storyline and some background about her first really helps lead into the rest of the movie and with such a wide net of characters it's hard to pick one to be more important especially when we have this group that's just a bunch of similar psychic people i mean i i paid attention to Annie because I believe we all know we we grew up as kids probably about the same time we watched this we also watched Halloween Town with the actress Kimberly J. Brown in it so she was sort of it's funny being a kid and this is our draw into this not Stephen King not any of the adult actors but Kimberly J. Brown's in this kind of like how the original draw for watching High School Musical was that Ashley Tisdale was a star in it because Zac Efron and Vanessa Hudgens weren't a thing in real life. Can we just also talk about real quick um, how great she did in this? Like, char- like doing that character? Because that's not an easy character to get right. Like, she had to spend time getting into that character and really putting on the performance that she did. I thought, I mean, there was one or two moments where I thought it was a bit heavy, but I mean, she's a teenager and playing that kind of role... Like, it's just kind of astounding. Like, it really impressed me, like, watching it as an adult and being able to pay attention to that. Yeah, I mean, as a kid, I really didn't understand autism. I, I, I'm I fortunate enough that I, I haven't had anyone in my family afflicted uh, as severely as the character of Annie is. So I really didn't understand it. I knew it was—my parents did explain it to me as a mental handicap, 
but I, I really didn't understand the parameters of it. But it did make me curious about it and did make me mindful of it. And to my knowledge, this is, well, well, not even to my knowledge. I would say this is one of the, f probably one of the first instances where we have this happening. But she's also a badass hero in the story, in her own right. Jacob, what do you think about it? Uh, about autism or just about the prologue in general? How about both? What What is the podcast's official stance on autism? I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out if I have it or not. But regarding the same the TikTok keeps telling me that I do, but I think it's all just relatable things. And the old and the southern person in me just wants to say, "No, you're just like that because you're lazy. You just need, you room... just need to put some dirt on it." I had a room full of people just like openly tell me they thought I was autistic once, and so I pretended to have no idea what they were talking about and have them <laughs> explain it to me for an hour. This one guy kept calling me low needs. Which he he was like a, a few extra times away from getting punched over that one, because I'm high functioning, <laughs> I'm not low needs. Uh, but, but anyway, but back to the back to the prologue. I love how this is exactly some Stephen King shit to do, right? You turn on a mini series about a big haunted house full of vindictive ghosts, and what's the prologue? It's some crazy psychic girl dropping boulders on her neighbor's house. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? This is exactly like what Stephen King does all the time. Like, hey, let's have a story about a bunch of inmates in a prison where this wonderful guy is going to get executed for a crime he didn't commit. And also, he can heal people by vomiting bees. Yes, let's write that. Like, the, that's you called Rose Red... <laughs> Stephen King's greatest hits, not necessarily in a good way, but it's true. Like, this is just exactly what I think of when I think of Stephen King. It's like, you, you take the story that you expect, and you just fill it with random shit, and it's good for some reason. And at the end of I mean, the book, Carrie, there is a character, because for those who haven't read it, the book Carrie is, isn't done in the linear format that any of the movies are. It's basically supposed to be a scrapbook with collections of news reports, diaries, autobiographies of survivors, and just relevant police report information, all that. Um, and at the end, there's a letter about ju just someone in a town called Royal Knob, Tennessee, just writing a letter to someone they know, and they mention their daughter, who was born named Annie, who is sitting there moving marbles with her mind. So he, ca I kind of feel like he borrowed this character for that. We don't get any more allusions to that instance in particular, but I feel like this is a spiritual follow-up to that character, at least. He's certainly creative with what he does as far as his antagonists and the villains of his story and the, the basically the the bad guys, the baddies. is They're just always so different, unique, and nothing you'd ever, you'd ever think of. Like, it's obviously something he had to have dreamed up because, I mean... One of the villains, one of the monsters is a, is a hairy meatball monster that just... That eats time or something. <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing about Stephen King that I've noticed from reading and doing all this is for as great as a writer as he is, his characters are, for lack of a better word, a lot more black and white. You don't necessarily... If someone's a good character, they're a good character. And if they're a bad character, they're a bad character. Which, which I'm not knocking him or anything. I think it's very comforting having that distinction, because um, now everybody's trying to force complex characters by making them do bad things and then be redeemable. Yeah, sometimes I really do want that black and white. Well, I know what to kind of expect from them, mm -hmm. and in 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 a sense. I mean, I do like the complexity at some points just to spice things up, but I, I do enjoy it's pretty, you know, they're either going to get worse or they're going to get better from here. Like, it's one or the other. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree that King has that tendency to have characters that are more black and white, but I don't think that applies to Rose Red. I, I feel like most of the characters in Rose Red are very complex. I mean, who would you even consider to be the villain of this story? I'm curious, because I, I have my own opinions on that. The house. So you say the house. All right. Martha, what do you say? Definitely the house. But part of me also... The glass ceiling of academia. <laughs> <laughs> if only we I had some boulders. I'm trying my best. Yeah, true. The boulders. The boulders could be the bad guys, obviously. I really don't like Ellen. I, 
I don't think I think she got abused and as she had she was just as a result of that she just became a really shitty person only cared about herself maybe I can elaborate on this because I read a good portion of the diary I didn't have time to read the whole thing but the character of Ellen and the movie does frame her as more of the victim of circumstance and things going on that are projected upon her by John who if I were to say if there was a villain in this story they definitely paint John Rimbauer as a main villain as well as what's his name the guy over the Miller. newspaper and the tenure committee Miller, Miller. um he's all, he's also an anti- I wouldn't call them the antagonist but they're that they still are foils to the main characters and what's going on but Ellen is a lot more of uh, she, she, she's kind of a terrible person too who just kind of hides behind these even worse people the the first section of her journal talks about how she wants to marry john so badly that she uh makes a dark prayer to the devil for it so from the beginning this isn't somebody who is a very kind protagonist from jump she is set out to do some evil stuff but i think that was mostly to try to set up some complexity because we never really figure out what's going on with why rose red is evil there's several theories brought up but there's never one clear-cut definition so Maybe this is a, a controversial take then, I don't know, but I feel like Joyce is the villain. I know that she's the protagonist as well, but I don't think that, that changes it. So I, I consider Rose Red the house to be more of like a neutral entity, right? Like just some natural force that from a human perspective is evil. Joyce is the one that goes poking it. She's the one that sticks a sticks a spear at the lion, and she bribes people to go with her and puts their lives in danger. She smears blood all over her director's face. Uh, she she knowing she lies to them. She says over and over again, "It's a dead cell." You know she doesn't believe that shit. the The people don't believe that shit. Nobody believes that. She is like voluntarily endangering all these people for the sake of her own career. I feel like she's the villain. Now that's 100% true, and that's one thing I wanted to bring up. Watching this initially, a little, little bit of a spoiler for the third section of the movie, Joyce kind of goes off the rails as a character. She just kind of goes full crazy. And looking back on it, I thought that was very unearned, because it almost feels like she just snaps. But just watching this first episode, you could tell this lady was unhinged. Mostly because I have this weird thing with people where I just yes and them. So having a conversation about losing your tenure, smearing blood on someone's face, that's a natural, that's a, not only a natural response, that is the natural evolution in how that conversation would go. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with that. That's 100% how I feel or how I felt watching it last night is I, I also the first time around watching it thought maybe it was a little unearned, but rewatching it, there's definitely the signs there and like her subtle behaviors. It's not super in your face, but it's the subtle things that she does in her reactions. It's the, some of the looks she gives when they're not looking, some of the, the side eye or the, you know, the mumble. And a lot more of, a lot more of the coldness of her and Steve's relationship. As an adult, I caught on to that a lot Yeah, when more. I was younger, I thought that the relationship was just normal and that they really did love each other and he just happened to be. But as an adult watching it now, that's definitely not how, how it was. It was certainly, she she saw an opportunity to get what she wanted, so she went the easiest routine to, way to guarantee that he wouldn't deny her. Which, which would, you know, sex. You're, you're calling these uh, hints subtle. That, that Joyce was going to maybe go crazy. I feel like it is obvious. I mean, just like what you said, Martha, she's sleeping with this guy. She's using him just so that she can get into his house. She gives a villainous monologue to her director and then smears blood all over his face. On top of what it, everything else already said, she's crazy! So the blood smearing, yeah, that was kind of like the first real indication that something else. But the rest of the time, she was acting fairly normal in her responses to everything. Like her original responses to Miller were very clean cut, 
just sentence like a little bit of wordplay. She wasn't as unhinged. And then when she had that moment, yeah, it was kind of like a snapping for her, I think, once her tenure, which is honestly her tenure got revoked. So she wasn't guaranteed a job, which she knew more than likely would result in her getting fired. So I, I feel like maybe that was like a breaking point to let out some of the unhinged. But up until that point, she was really good at hiding it. I think she was always crazy. Now, I'm not saying she wasn't crazy. I'm just saying she had a little bit more composure to her to be able to try to keep it under the surface more than as it progressed throughout the movie. I would say, too, as an adult, as well, as a child, you don't really have the frame of reference for what kind of a person a professor of parapsychology would be. So I think that is also, as a fully formed adult with a fully formed adult brain watching this, understanding what kind of an individual a tenured professor of parapsychology would be so it makes a lot more of what this character is especially because we do get the hint that she came from what was it uh childhood science or childhood psychology i think it was i don't remember to be honest it was just a throwaway line that miller gave because she was a respected respected person in the childhood psychology division and somehow she made this jump which i would like to know more about that but we never really at least from the first episode we don't really get anything i nearly died laughing when miller told her to go polish her crystal for some reason i feel like that (laughs) line hit so much harder in our present day than it did like 20 years ago it had me cackling because i have you know i have crystals and i do polish them they be looking good i i have an acquaintance who is constantly using dating apps to try to find somebody and it has become a meme that every single person he goes out with has crystals it'll just be like he's like hey i have a date tonight i'm like i bet she's got crystals and he's like the next morning he's like yeah (laughs) see here's the thing about it though is it an I'm amethyst? Not, I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna pretend. I just think they're pretty. I I don't. I don't buy the books. I don't. I don't even like. You know how those girls they'll buy the books. I don't ever read them. They're literally coffee table books. It's all decoration, but they try to act like it's not because for whatever reason they think it would be weird for them to to just like the aesthetic. I I just like the aesthetic. I ain't even afraid to tell you. I just, I just think it's pretty. Martha was definitely that kid you played with on the playground who would make everybody stop what they were doing and look at a cool rock she found. And then when you wanted to hold it, she's like, no, don't touch it. It's worth money. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah, care that rose quartz symbolizes love, Martha? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I Neither do I. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that one's true, though. I, I, I know a little bit, but, like, I've never, it's never hold, held my interest, because I'm like, this is some bullshit. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> like, you just, and I have them everywhere, so it's definitely not true. <laughs> be like, I need to charge my crystals, and be like, I have an ox cord. Now, I do think that mental manifestations, I think, just for the fact that you're not making something physically happen, you're basically just altering your perception to make yourself work towards it. That's all that is. You're basically telling yourself, you know, this is going to happen, and then you do things to make it happen. I feel like that that's true. But I feel like as far as, like, just manifest... I'm a manifest to my husband. I'm manifesting a husband. I manifest... That, 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 you ain't going to get married. Not like that. <laughs> So, um, anyways, let's get back on topic before I go off on way too many rants. So, so back to what we're here to discuss, the first night of Rose Red, this whole college campus, um, and kind of what we think about in this professional environment Joyce Reardon has created for herself. Clearly, she's kind of the joke of the department, probably the joke of the school. And even in just her little actions and how I'm passionate she is about it and i don't know if you guys notice this in her office her whole wall that is just like a uh, rose red murder connection board yeah it really gave me a better appreciation for the movie that we watched because knowing what happens to her this kind of evens out her her sensibilities because god does she turn crazy and originally i didn't catch up on the nuances because I don't know what a psychology professor does or what their life was like when I was a kid, but as an adult seeing it and seeing how she reacts and her relationship with Steve and how toxic that is, I can tell she's kind of the villain if we have to pin one down and not just blame the uh, patriarchal academic society. Does anybody have anything else to add about the school? Was there anything in particular that you guys noticed about the school or the college that stood out to you? Very typical college, overfilled classrooms. 
Although... <laughs> no, I will say this is my idea of... This is probably what so, my big idea of what a college class and what a college campus was. Not necessarily true. Was a bit let down. Nobody's in jogging pants. Um, nobody was just asleep. And people were taking the parapsychology class very seriously. Because you know that's just an elective course. Yeah, they're just trying to get a credit, like, for sure. <laughs> there's, no re- there's no way any of them were interested in going into that field. That was definitely a... This will be a good class with a crazy professor that we pretty much just sit and listen to her rant about Rose Red for a semester. I appreciated that they took the time to go into the departmental politics of getting something like this set up. Because once again, they could have just said, okay, we're going on an expedition to Rose Red. But no, they've shown how their director is worried that it's going to reflect poorly on their use of budget. They showed that she waited for him to go away and had, like, his replacement approve the project because she knew that he wouldn't. Like, there's an entire political backstory to this entire ghost hunt uh, that that isn't necessary to tell the the meat of the story, but to, to my mind just makes it so much better. It's so funny watching movies from when you were younger and seeing how the people age up like the Harry Potter kids. There's something still in the back of my brain when I watch Sorcerer's Stone and I'm like, those kids are older than me. Mm-hmm. In my head, I still feel like those kids are older than me because I watched it when I was six and at the time they were older than me. The character that were introduced in the first scene outside of the prologue, Kevin Bollinger, who's a school reporter who's asking these leading questions about where the money's coming from in the expedition. He still feels older than me, even though he says that he's only like 20. Maybe it's just because the actor looks Uh, that way, but... mm. I couldn't... Okay, so the thing about Bollinger's actor is, obviously he plays a McPoyle brother in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, so... Now now that that's one of my favorite shows of all time, and I've seen that as many times as I have, all I can think of is McPoyle. And so, it, 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 although I can appreciate the actor now, having seen him in something else, something like this, and seen how diverse it is from another character he plays very, very well, um, certainly gave it a more interesting aspect for me. Um, but yeah, it was really rough for me to, to, to take his character and, and think of it of anything other than it's the McPoyle brother. You know, I still do the same thing that you do, Dylan, with thinking that so many of these characters are older than me. But I think part of that is the fact that some of them are. Like, especially if you watch movies like Scream or where, where you have these these twenty year olds in air quotes who are like thirty five. I don't. I, I'm I'm sitting here like I'm I'm twenty four, twenty five years old, and I'm like that sixteen year old is definitely a decade older than me. No, hundred percent. And Kevin Bollinger is definitely a full grown adult. He's at least almost. 30. And no, no offense to the actor, because I kind of also have a crush on him, working through that after watching this the other day. But he just looks way older than a college sophomore. J- just way older. But I can also appreciate what you said, Jacob, about all the inner, inner academic politics that went on to get this approved and all of the red tape that she had to go around to get this project approved that's just like her uh crazy obsession and it helps as a buffer against people saying things like this is stupid why would somebody do this because you can see in universe that people do think it's stupid uh and and so it's like I, I said I thought Joyce was very villainous, and there are many reasons, but one of it is the classic, uh, you were worried about whether you could, not whether you should, right? Like, science trying to reach so far that it burns its hand on something that it shouldn't have touched. To me, that's that's what Rose Red is about. Perhaps we should also talk now about, because um, whenever Joyce is in her office, she's also pulling files to finalize the people that she's going to have for this trip, which what she says is she's planning a trip to Rose Red, and she's gathering all these psychics to potentially cause a spark in this dead cell so that she can at least have something undeniable as proof when she comes back to validate what she does with the university and in her career. What do you guys think of the group of psychics? Was there one in there that stood out to you besides Annie, of course, or one that you connected to most? Um, and also just one to throw out there, 
what would your psychic power be in this universe? Oh, okay. So I really don't want to play favorites because I think that one of the best things this film does is create this unique cast of characters. Once again, this feels like such a Stephen King thing to do to say, okay, we're going to have this big house full of psychics. How about I give each psychic their own different power? almost like some kind of superhero team, and have separate stories for each of them. It's so good. I love it. Um, if I had to pick a favorite, I've already, I've already said this. I love Nick. I love every time Nick talks. I love his personality. I love how coy he is about his power. Partly, like, like it's partly arrogance because it is such a good power, and it's partly modesty because he knows people don't want like their thoughts being read and, and things like that. It's going to unnerve them and make them treat him weirdly. So he's like just this such a sensitive but confident guy who kind of reminds me like as far as his voice goes of Simon Cowell. Uh, I, I don't know. But like every every minute he's on screen, I absolutely adore it. Um, but but I, so... I don't dislike any of them. I also like the dude with the, the weird looking face and the mother who buys stuffed animals. Like he's so entertaining Emery. as well. Emery, yes. One, one thing that I will say that I picked up on Nick's character, Nick seems to be in the know about a lot more. And I think that's where his portrayal as a character comes in, where he's able to read minds and kind of see what's going on because you get this idea he can also see a little bit more what's going on i feel like he's the only one who truly knows more of uh joyce's motives which creates an interesting conversation as to why he would get into this if he has an inkling about what's going on and also what's going to happen i think that a, a lot of that is attributed to nick genuinely wants to help people and keep them out of harm so i think for him it was more of i'm gonna go along so that I, I can help and make sure that like if you know anything happens there's someone to actually be a benefit of help and can see what's coming maybe to protect the ones that can't because he knew she was gonna do it no matter what because <laughs> she knew who is you know he knew her intentions yeah and martha i'm gonna throw the question at you too pretty much the same thing um, what, uh, uh, which one of the psychics in this story stood out to you? Was it, and was it a power per se? And what, what do you think your power would be in universe? I genuinely enjoyed all of, all of the psychics and their, their storylines, um, and, and their character development as a whole. The only, I think the one that I, I kind of didn't really relate to as much or really have much of an interest in was Vic. Um, the older man, I, there was just, just a lot, anything for me to relate to. And he was kind of just a horny old bastard. For me, it was so. Vic <laughs> and Pam. Uh, I think if we had to nail down two that were kind of underdeveloped and underutilized, it was them. Pam was more, you know, later down the road used in a, a different aspect than an actual character. <sighs> yeah, um, she's just more so, of a I foil. Mean, they kind of had to cut her short. Yeah, she's, she, exactly. She's more of a character foil, I think, for... Um, a couple of other characters, not just one specifically. Um, but yeah, I'll agree with that. She definitely was a full, like she was more there to bounce off other characters and help along their character development. And I'll, um, I'll also go as far things. to say that with, with these characters, Vic and Pam, they, their powers are so similar to other characters who I think, not that they're not well written characters, but characters that are written better also have sim similar attributes. They're not a touch no, or they don't do whatever Vic does. I'm, I, I think he just kind of sees the future. Yes, um, yeah, but, I think he just sees vision, but not really future. interesting. But but anyway, there's other characters that are written better that can basically serve the same purpose that I'm more invested in. Um, me personally, I really like Kathy. That's what I was about to say. I think if I had to pick one that I did enjoy the most was was definitely um, Kathy out of it. She did have a really interesting character development um, along the way, and I think she learned a lot from the other characters. But you know, specifically Pam and Nick. I think she built off them. And in, in it's so group. funny because in all the reviews, Kathy gets the most shit. I can I can kind of understand it because it was harder to because of the age they made her and the the constant praying um, which i understand it was you know for her character and stuff it just made it harder to to like her 
um, because she wasn't. The term overzealous Christian comes in when describing her, and I don't think that's necessarily fair. Uh, yeah, because she's not shoving it in everybody's faces. What she does is comfort for her in the moments that she needs the comfort. Um, she's not pushing it down anybody else's throat. Um, Especially like other Stephen King characters do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's definitely not meant to be like a big part of her you know character attributes because it's not it's more just like a fact that she has this belief and this is something that she uses to comfort her it's more of like a seeing like a more vulnerable side to her because before shit hits the fan you don't even really realize that about her because she even she she drinks beer she has you know talk stories with all the rest of them she doesn't set herself apart from them um nor tr even mention too i feel like a character like this probably wouldn't if it is the charismatic Christian character or the overzealous Christian character, I feel like in the Stephen King universe, they'd be trying to hide their powers. This woman signed up for a college study, not but not to understand what she can do, but because she knew she could do it and was a professional in this field of doing it. Which that takes me... So I, I honestly thought she was a well-rounded character. Yeah, and that takes me to why I, if I had any of the the abilities, I think I would probably want to be hers because she seems to be able to kind of control when it happens and so she can go looking for information that she wants or to see certain things if she wants but if she's not wanting to do that at that point in time or whatever she seems to be able to just not a, a couple points that i need to make one i love the idea of an overzealous christian automatic writer who every single thing they write is a bible verse applicable to the present situation I think that that would be hilarious. Secondly, I didn't actually answer the question about which power that I would have, but just in case it wasn't clear, I would like to have Nick's power. I, being able to read people's minds, I think, would just be so fascinating. And whether or not I would enjoy it, I think it's what I, my personality would lend itself to the most. Also, y'all be shitting on my man Vic. Vic is cool. I don't know what y'all have against Vic. It's not that I don't. I, I, I now I don't know. I don't know what Martha's issue is with Vic. I'm a woman. <laughs> That's my issue with Vic. But I, okay, so as I don't hate him or anything. I he, she reads him as pervy old man. I don't get that from him. I just can't really nail him down. All I see is a man who is ED very pills. sick with a heart condition who's about to die. Because he has ED. No, he was. Yes, he was. He wasn't taking ED pills. Did you ED not pills? notice how he stepped away during the dance? Not in part one. He doesn't take ED pills in part one. But he, at some point in time in the story, takes ED pills. Because he thinks he's going to get some. Okay. And so that's, okay. Number one. But, like, you guys don't let me finish. So, <laughs> when it comes to Vic, I don't hate <laughs> him. And the, that pervy, like, part of him is just a very small part of the character that I see overall. I just, I don't relate to him. Like, he seems like a, like a nice, gentle old man that has his faith that is just trying to use his ability for good i guess like he's not harming nobody he's not you know and he's a nice guy there's just not there's nothing for me to latch on to with him as a character like there's nothing that relates me to him in any type of way or or that i fully understand or feel like he's that I feel like he was the least developed out of all the psychics. What is pervy about pe taking ED pills? It's a dysfunction. He's taking medication for it. You know Pam wasn't going to fuck him. So? <laughs> it's okay to be prepared. Like, it's okay to be prepared. That's a serious issue. <laughs> Many people suffer from erectile dysfunction. That doesn't I make know, you a pervert. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying he was going to approach her is all I'm saying. Well, yeah, but who knows? Maybe he just liked the encounter and he was going to go back to his room and do something. It was just the way... You don't okay, know. We'll talk about it in the next one. Next we'll episode. We'll talk about it in the next one. But anyway, I, th I think my issue with Vic is that he gets the most lines that are the most Stephen King-ism lines. All the folksy kind of waxings that, it, that sound cool on paper. And when you're reading it in your head sound wise, but when they when they come out of like a living person's mouth, they come across as a bit cringy and uh, almost pompous. That's what was my that shit he box. said about a hawk? Uh, at the, at Tell the a hawk from a handsaw yeah. in, when the nor when the wind is in the northeast or something. Yes. What, what the hell does that mean? I don't, I have never... Again, I don't, again, he gets the most folksy-isms, and 
there, there are little tidbits of dialogue writing in here that you can really tell are Stephen King because his his writing style is very pulpy and it sounds really good when you read it because you understand the character's inner workings and you understand why they talk and speak the way they do. But when you hear a normal per a normal person saying some of these lines, it comes off as a bit clunky um, by how Stephen Kingy they are. Fairness, none of these are normal people. Like, they all have license to be really weird. I mean, they're not normal people, period. They're all psychics, so. One character, because he is pretty prominent, I would say the Annie storyline and the Emery storyline are the two storylines in this movie, well, in, in this episode, that are most prominent when it comes to the psychics. And I'm kind of wondering why that is, why Emery and Annie get the most character development before the actual inciting incident of them going to the house. Do any of you have a hot take on that? Martha, do you want to say, I don't want to interrupt you while you're disparaging disabled old men. <laughs> Go ahead, Jacob. No, no, I, I, I don't. Martha, it's not enough for her to just be a boner killer. <laughs> she has to be a boner stopper, too. Proactive. Boner <laughs> disruption. Absolutely unacceptable. Uh, Emery and Annie. So both of them have uh, overbearing parental figures. I don't know if that mm -hmm. has something to do with it, but uh, Emery, at least in the first part we have here, his relationship with his mother is really not flushed, uh, fleshed out any. It's mostly just that she appears overbearing and irresponsible. With Annie, we get a, a lot more, and I, I actually quite like the father. I mean, he comes off in, at first as just sort of like this abusive, domineering kind of asshole father figure, but you then get a scene where he's talking to sister, uh, where you can clearly tell that he's doing what he feels is right, and he's worried about Annie and, and wants to protect her, but he, he has a child who is autistic and can cause boulders to fall from the sky. He's a little bit out of his depth, a and I, I just really enjoyed that because even, even the traditional uh, sort of, sort of uh, well, that type of character got well-rounded. Now, a as to your original question, I don't know why he went with those two. Uh, may maybe you have more insight, Martha, but I did think that there might be a connection there with the parents in the household. No, I mean, I definitely agree, um, with them having that, that connection as, you know, as far as the relationship with their parents, things of that nature. There are also two ends of a spectrum, whereas Emery sees the past, she more sees like the present is telekinetic, can see some of the past in the present, she's, she's got a wider range that she can do, but... The fact that Emery even has, like, physical manifestations is kind of an attribute to how he's kind of shit on throughout it for him being precognitive. Nobody really understands, like, the actual hallucinations. Like, they're not hallucinations to him. They're real. They're, like, physical man manifestations. So I feel like the fact that they both have such strong things that they have to battle through as far as, like, living with those powers. Because you can tell with both of them, neither one of them necessarily want to have powers and with annie i feel like it's more sh it she really enjoys being praised when her powers are or something because she gets praised and stuff that she's not used to and she lives off that and i feel like emory to an extent part of the reason why he does what he does is because he likes that he gets the recognition for it i mean of course he's broke so he has a, a really good reason to want to do it because he's broke is but the reason he's broke is because of his mom honestly like just being honest. So I feel like their, their driving motivations are very similar as far as like the core of the character. And I feel like they they can, they can have the potential to really be able to understand each other at the end of the day because they're both, they're both built up to be, cat, you know, like uh, outsiders or the, the different from norm. Neither one of them fit in very well with society as a whole. I will say one thing that I really liked about Emery specifically was that he makes it very clear that he thinks that going to Rose Red is a terrible idea. And, but he says over and over again, save the warnings for somebody who isn't broke. Like one of the, one of the criticisms that are often levied, especially by me at the protagonists of horror films, is that they're really stupid and they make horrible decisions. I love that uh, we're kind of getting that mitigated here with Rose Red because most of the characters involved in this know that what they're doing is stupid. 
but they have their own various reasons for doing it anyway. It might be money. It might be that they want to get out of the thumb of their parents. It might be they want to protect others or, or make their uh, name in, in their field of study. They all have fairly reasonable, if potentially misguided, motivations, and it helps to, to stop from people pointing at the screen and saying, just leave. Right, and it seems to be an understood fact in this in the universe of this movie that Rose Red is a haunted house. I feel like with a lot of other haunted house movies, the argument of is it actually haunted and the whole gaslighting of people seeing things and dismissing them is usually the first and most of the second act. But in this movie, it's well understood that Rose Red is a certified haunted house. People go missing. People have died in this house at a staggering number. And right now it's a dead cell and they're going back to it to just give it a little spark. You know, speaking of gaslighting, the father made the statement that bringing Annie into Rose Red was like using a, a lighter to check how much gas you have. Uh, and I, firstly, I love that analogy. But secondly, I, regardless of whether he is like a, a nice guy or not, I feel like he's right. Like it really just seems terribly reckless to bring Annie into this place. And that that's the only one of them. I know Annie's like the big major psychic character, but that's the only one of them where I really think, no, this was a bad idea. And I think part of the reason that, you know, it ultimately is, is Joyce's motivation. I think it's she also understands what's going to happen and she knows she just doesn't care. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can tell from the beginning she's more concerned with the notoriety of what's going to happen than any potential consequences. And honestly, her love affair with the house, if something major does happen, that, that, will, that will just be the icing on the cake for her. Not really knowing what she's getting herself into. We brushed over this character a bit, but I did want to mention Annie's mother, who is a... Uh, if we say the father is holding everything together, the mother is not. The mother is one broken dish away from a mental breakdown. Have either of you watched Gravity Falls, the Disney show? Yes. Martha, no, I have haven't. You? Okay, so there's a, there's a character in there. Minor spoilers, I guess. Not really. Uh, who has? He's a child, and he has psychic powers. And we, his dad is a very prominent character, but we never really see his mother. And and in one of the episodes, we just see this old woman with like gray hair in the background with a vacuum, and she just says, "Just keep vacuuming, just keep vacuuming." And that is the exact vibe that I got from the mother in, in Rose Red. Like she's just. She is not holding it together. Well, she is holding it together, but she's holding it together by, like, a thread. Like, she's just on the verge of having a breakdown trying to deal with all this supernatural nonsense. And it's... it's Very poorly holding it it's together. It's easy for me to understand, though, why she is the way that she is about it. Um, for the simple fact that when you're pregnant oh, no. with a child, all you think about is what... how the great things they're going to do, um, who they're going to be, what a normal childhood looks like for a child. So imagine you have your child, you think everything's normal, then you find out they're autistic. And then later down the road, you start to discover that they're able to destroy your neighbor's house just because the dog ran in, in bitter. Like, that is an absolutely terrifying. And you have to live with that, knowing that you, that was your creation. Like, people... Um, would react in one of two ways. Either they become overprotective of the child, and like sister, or they completely reject and have so many issues dealing with it that they don't cope. They just they just don't. I would train the child as a weapon. <laughs> yes, you would, Jacob. Yes, you would. You would but... have to train your Jack and Annie. <laughs> one thing that I think is also important to note is when this movie came out, we were still really figuring out autism. I think... The actual idea of autism had only been around for the actual serious understanding and pop culture understanding of autism had only been around for about 15 years. So culturally, a lot of people were still figuring out what that was. And watching it as an adult, this does seem like she is a bit more of a loose cannon. Whereas when I watched it as a kid, I thought, no problem, she'll be able to handle herself. But as we see... She she's very easily manipulated by this house to do what it wants. Well, you're referencing something that's in a that's past the the part that we're supposed to be discussing. What did I mention? The Annie like being manipulated by the house into doing what it wants. Well, folks, um, 
just like spoiler but but again this character it, it helps having sister as a voice for her because we kind of get some insight into it which i think for something like this you need otherwise the character would be too vague so really the only things we know about annie which you can really read into this is what sister tells us about annie and annie can 100 per i mean uh sister can 100 percent be off base with her observations of Annie. And in this episode, and I believe we'll see probably in future episodes maybe, we never really know what's going on in Annie's head. Things happen and then they stop happening. So a really good example of that is like in this first part where sister's trying to convince her her dad that, you know, they need to go. There's basically Annie shakes the house. Um, And... Sister interprets it as Annie's way of saying she wants to go to Rose Red, but in my mind, I'm thinking, no, that's just her reacting to you fighting. She doesn't like you guys fighting because she loves both of you, and she just... I feel like Annie tries very hard on a daily basis to not let her emotional outburst result in anyone getting harmed. So I feel like when there's people around her having the emotional outburst, it makes it really hard for her to control, and so it kind of seeps through, and I feel like it's like a constant thing that she's having to do. You could even perceive the prologue, because in the background, dad and sister are fighting. Perhaps what happened with the house was less of a reaction to uh, the dog biting her and more of a reaction to uh, the fighting. Because I could see, I could see a young, I think she's supposed to be three or four years old. I could see a young child, especially a child with autism, not correlating the dog biting being bad because she could have done something right then. She associated her family fighting with the neighbors and therefore the neighbors were the bad people. And if something happened to the neighbors, dad and sister would stop fighting. So that's a really good observation, Martha, that I never uh, put together. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I didn't put that together either, but it makes sense now that you talk about it. Because she was drawing the house, but she didn't – if I remember correctly, she did not scribble it out and, like, cause the rocks to fall until after the, the sister and the father had been fighting for a while. Either it's in a deleted scene or a flashback scene to what happened with the dog that she – she sends the dog back or something or pushes it away. That honestly could have been all it needed to be. And as powerful as she is, we know she could have automatically done something. She could have automatically done something to the house, to the dog, whatever, but she didn't. So that does lead me to believe that she is more in tune with her surroundings, but especially in the prologue has a limited understanding. Yeah. Cause she didn't kill the dog. Um, the dog got euthanized for biting her. So it definitely wasn't, Annie's fault at all <clears throat> what happened and, and the resulting of the dog being put down because all she did was fling the dog back not even aggressive dog didn't even hit anything it just whimpered a little bit because it was surprised so she didn't harm it in any type of way even though it had harmed her she understood that you know she didn't have ill intent she just didn't want it to continue to bite her or sister because sister was even saying do something about the dog make it stop okay so in the beginning we know the dog gets put down clearly Annie's family must have made a fuss and the dog had to be put down. Which makes me think that they're actually bad people, because I get it, the dog bit someone. But you know Annie's weird, she's psychic. The animals, horses, everything, they're going to react to her differently. I'm sorry, I just don't like animals being put down. That that This is my little animals getting put down soapbox. No, I understand, I have a pit bull, so I, have, I understand. A dog getting put down for biting somebody would be the equivalent of a human being executed for punching somebody. Like that's a that's an extraordinary overreaction. It is, but in, uh, I'm not and sure I mean, why she people fl- are even She okay flung with the it. dog across the yard, so I think she got her two cents in. Don't need to euthanize it, but that happened. So here there we are. There are some um, states or provinces or whatever that indicate that if if a dog is involved in in any type of bite whatsoever, it's an immediate euthanization. Um, it's no if ands buts. What was the situation? It's like an immediate put down like there's been instances where people have broken into homes and the dog was just defending the home and the dog had to be put down like that happens yeah so i i know so much about this because i i have to be you know i have a pit that means so much to me and so like her entire lifespan people have treated her different people have seen the worst of her and 
I'm more scared of people like when I have when I take her out, she's in a full body harness. Um, she's muzzle trained for the instances that it would make people feel more comfortable if she was in a muzzle. She's a very well behaved dog and would never bite anyone. But I have to do that to protect her against those who might try to instigate it wanting that result because she would not there because I know in my area, your dog, it, it's like a strike system, um, you know. But some breeds are not a part of that strike system. It's a one and done. Like, they don't get second chances, and pits are one of them. So that's, like, always one of my greatest fears is my reactive dog reacting in a way that results in, in something happening like that. Um, because it's, yeah, it's it's terrifying that the dog would have to die over something as trivial as that. Keep, keep, keep Ariel away from psychic little girls. <laughs> Noted. That the dog will want to bite. <laughs> that is absolutely unacceptable. I don't even like dogs, really. But the notion that a dog would bite someone who is breaking into a home, and then the dog would be euthanized for that, I don't think any sane person could be okay with that. Oh, yeah, it's awful. It should be a, you should analyze the context just like any other situation. Was the bite justified or not? Some people don't understand I'm truly that. astonished. I'm not... S- I'm not surprised because I, I think that most uh, people are pretty shit. But but like, how can that still be a it's, thing? Yeah, it stems from the fact that there's still misconceptions out there that dogs behave like if a dog does this now, they're always gonna do it. Or um, if they show aggression mm-hmm. now, that just means they're aggr- they're gonna bite more people in the future because now they got a test for it and they're gonna do it more often. I'm like, well, no, dogs are very easy to correct. They're a reflection of exactly. their owners. It's like. Uh, so we should euthanize the owners. <laughs> yes. In a lot I, of I'm situations, it I is will, their fault. I will get behind that one. There is a lot of owners that don't take the precautions. Like, my dog is reactive. Like, I know that about my dog. I take actions to make sure that her being reactive is never going to put her in harm's way. But there are owners out there that have reactive dogs. They don't set them up for success. They, left, they lead them off leash. They let them, you know, very under-trained. And so they let them out into the world, and then they wonder why this situation has occurred that now they're having to put their dog down. Because they just chose not to be responsible pet owners. I really love animals, and we started a topic that I'm just going to go on forever for, so we should probably talk about something else. We, we probably should get back to, to the movie, yeah. But it's Deep an established thing at this point. Like, we just go on tangents, and that's fine. <laughs> Our next big thing we should probably discuss is this little impromptu class that Joyce holds for the p- participants, the psychics in this group, before the vacation, sort of a debriefing. And by debriefing, this is about a 30-minute scene where she just details the history of John and Ellen Rimbauer, the house, the building of the house, all of that. And I just love this scene so much. It's I can see a modern take of this. Maybe making it an episode of its own where we actually follow this as a prequel. But the person that likes sitting in lectures in me and listening to people talk really enjoyed this. This was probably my first idea of what a podcast would be. And oh, by the way, Rose Rib, even though we're covering the movie, would make an excellent podcast. Make it hosted by Joyce Reardon and then have her going through the history. Boom. I like that you mentioned that one other way to do this would be to actually have an episode dedicated to the backstory and that maybe we would see it like in the period in which it occurs, right? Like have the Teamster in the form and be characters, have um, uh, the, the Limbowers be or Rimbowers be uh, characters. And I, I appreciate so much that they didn't do that. Because one thing that's really important to me, especially in haunted house stories, is the fact that the past is not it's impossible to know 100 percent what happened all you have is the story that gets passed down through generations and it's almost certainly wrong so having a flashback where you see canonically exactly what happened to me that's boring the world doesn't work that way we don't know for sure what happened yesterday let alone a hundred years ago and they do a good job establishing this as supposing to be real because they give names and significance to just passing things like the foreman and the teamster they have actual names that get said in passing where they go um 
in their day to day also has a name as though they're real places and things and I think that's really interesting but in this in this little flashback we get well not flashback in this little class we learn that John, John and Ellen they get married John is 20 years her senior and they go on this lavish honeymoon while they are while they're waiting for the house to finish being built and it has its own issues from day one and in this vacation in this vacation ellen comes down with a sickness she's down with a sickness oh. and we're to believe it's some std as a kid i totally missed it but i guess as an adult it's I don't know, some form of syphilis, maybe? I didn't understand it, that yesterday, either. I was like, what adult, like, what disease is carried by only a man but given to women? And I was like, oh, that makes sense now that you said STD. That That's definitely what it there's is. There's STDs that certain carriers cannot show symptoms, like gonorrhea. Gonorrhea, you cannot show symptoms, but I feel like I would have read a lot more diary entries where Ellen was talking about, God, it hurts to pee. I have this really nice house, but the seepage and the pain in my urine is unceasing. Do you think he gave her HIV? Because <laughs> it talked about her having... The government her. hadn't invented that yet. Oh, okay. Every time I get up to use the bathroom, it's in a different spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up, Jacob, because that brings up another fun thing they talk about in this little class wherein this house isn't just any haunted house this house has been growing on its own since an inciting incident where because of these ills she sought out a psychic and the psychic told her that basically she wouldn't die until she said the house was finished so this whole time we've done this uh winchester mansion thing of just building onto the house and creating new things and until ellen says it's finished she's going to keep on living. Does anyone want to expound upon anything I discussed there? I just think the element of the house growing on its own and changing is one of the most fascinating parts. It's one of, it's one of the best examples of uh, what you see versus what you don't see in film and television, because for as much as we see of this house later, I am still enamored about what we don't see. You could easily have a sequel where people explore different parts of the house. I also really enjoyed just how much from the Winchester, the Winchester house it, it took, because there are false doors in the Winchester house. There are hallways that lead to nowhere. There are um, weird offsetting balconies things of that nature that don't exist in your traditional home or mansion no matter how large it is um from that and also just the winchester house was just like jacob talked about earlier being one of those big haunted mansions um that just really took people's curiosity um and to be able to take that and put that into a setting it just he used so much of the legends behind it to kind of build what Rose Red would be, you know, the changing on its own, um, things of that nature, and like it never stopping growing. Um, was just I just really liked that aspect of it that he took so much from the Winchester house to like kind of establish that. I love how the house is consistently compared to a cancer. One of the one of the things that is stated during this lecture scene when Joyce shows the original house when it was first built and then the house now, one of the members of the audience, I don't remember who, says that it looks like it metastasized. As if the house itself was a tumor, like, on the earth, and it just keeps growing. Like, it keeps growing, it keeps getting bigger. This, this evil thing uh, has a mind of its own and is spreading. Like, the idea that you would have a haunted house that is a literary an analogy for cancer, I think that's amazing. And there's something, too, to be said with how, just like a cancer, people are killed inside of it, or they just go missing. So, you could almost make this house, if you had to put a pin in an analogy for it, it's almost an analogy for loss. Uh, Ellen's inability to handle loss you know, in, in dying or, or of her children or her family or what she has. This house is ultimately the cause of great loss for so many and even 
to Ellen herself, despite her connection to it, we discover later. And you can honestly say the same for Joyce. Uh, it's something that has this promise to bring her so much, but ultimately, um, even if you haven't seen the next episode, brings her great loss. As, as annoyed as I am by the fact that they keep calling Rose Red a dead cell, because any person that has living cells in their brain can tell that it's not, I do like, again, the comparison uh, that is drawn here, as if... Uh, and may maybe this is something that people actually say, like, in the parapsychology field. I don't know. I know nothing about parapsychology. But the idea that a, a site of paranormal activity can become dormant or die, and you could somehow breathe life back into it by introducing psychic energy into the equation, like... I, I recognize it's some pretty shaky pseudoscience here, but I love that we are introducing a science into the the analysis of this haunting. Yes, it's not just, ooh, spooky house. Like, no, we're really kind of analyzing, okay, there's some kind of energy that causes this uh, phenomenon to manifest, and, and that energy has gone, and we're going to try to reintroduce it like a, like a twitch of electricity in, into a dead arm or something like that. Uh, it... It adds a layer of realism to me, and, and I like it, again, like you said, it's kind of grounded in some type of logic uh, that I, that I found to be very enjoyable. Yeah, and that's how I felt about it too. And it felt like they were presenting in a way that it was accepted, known science. Like the way that they talked about it, they didn't talk about it like it was theories. They talked about it like I know this is going to happen because we know this and this. And the psychics, because they're psychic, they believed in it and they knew it because they knew that that's how it functioned. That was a part, you know, something that they'd learned over time of just being psychic. So they just accepted it as honest truth. Like this is, like you said, a science. Um, it's not a theory. It's not something we're going to test out. Um, Joyce was even just certain from the very start. Um, and even all the psychics, they're like, okay, well, if you say it's a dead cell, then hopefully when it reacts, it don't react in a way that we're all going to die. Since it's dead, it's going to need some time to charge up. Um, bless their hearts. <laughs> you say, even if it is just a theory and it's not an established science, at least they have a plan, right? They're, they're not just going to be like, okay, let's go into this house and set up some cameras and... I don't know, piss on the wall, see what happens. No, no, they have a plan. They're like, okay, psychic energy, go into spooky house, we're going to trigger phenomenon. Like, I, I just love it. The characters in this feel so, like, competent and alive to me. It's funny you bring up a science and logic, because this movie does follow Stephen King sort of isms when it comes to parapsychology and what he knows in the field. A common thread through all of his work is that bad places have a consciousness and they attract bad people, which is an interesting reading when you go into this place attracts Joyce Reardon. So she is herself in some way a bad person or there is something, and we see throughout the next couple episodes that whatever in her that is bad comes out just like people's psychic powers, whatever's in them comes out later on. I also disliked with any mini series like these days, well, I don't like it, but some of the characters just aren't as well developed. So even for this mm -hmm. being a mini series, they did do a really good job of building up and fleshing out the characters in a short time frame for like a TV series. Because um, it's only three episodes. So. Um, that's kind of still limited time. Yeah, it's not all about the house. It's about these people interacting with the house. And I think that's what something we tend to lose sight of. Uh, we focus on the ship and not the waves and the wind and everything making the ship move. Performances you didn't think held up. As much as I really enjoy Nancy Travis, I can't say that her portrayal of Joyce was preferable. Let's say she, she was a bit campy. Right? She was a bit campy, and some stuff that, re hearing her lines, if you just put a little bit more subtlety on it, it would probably flow a little bit more naturally. But whenever she knows that the character has to be at a hundred crazy, such as rubbing blood on the face, I get that was in the script. But there was probably a way to do it that didn't read as, I'm acting crazy. 
And that's what I got from it. It wasn't her naturally doing yeah. this. This was her intentionally acting crazy. It mm-hmm. felt very forced at moments. Like there were moments that she would be doing really, really good at it. And then just her eyes would take on that crazy eye look um, that you associate an actor having when they're acting out someone who's acting crazy. And it didn't really feel like Joyce necessarily. It more or less felt, I don't know, it felt like I need to come across as crazy instead of letting my words do that for me is I've got to portray the rest. She was acting with all of her face and everything. And it really, I felt like it gave away more to her craziness than it could have if it had been kind of toned down. And Yeah, take, uh, take Stephen King's Annie Wilkes, for example, in Misery, a total wackadoo character, and those lines given to the wrong person would not w- would not work. But there's something in the performance of Kathy Bates as Annie Wilkes that just makes it work so realistically. Um, even when she's a hundred percent crazy, it she dials there's it up reason. appropriately and knows when to do it, and it doesn't feel like oh. This character is being crazy in this moment. I need to act crazy. I, I recognize these qualities in Nancy's performance of Joyce. I definitely agree with the both of you that those qualities are there, but I don't mind them. Like I view it more so no, as Joyce, Joyce's personality than I do a quirk of acting. Like I genuinely believe that Joyce, this ghost hunting parapsychologist who's willing to risk a bunch of people's lives in order to find proof of her passion. Uh, and is sleeping with the heir to the estate for the opportunity, I believe she would act like this. I've met people in real life that do act like this. <laughs> and This might be a bad time to bring this up now that we're about two hours into a three-part series that we're doing, but I really can't review this movie so much as react to it and speak my piece on it, simply because all these all these characters and all their motivations are almost second nature to me like it's a comfort to me it's like you you have family members who when you inspect them with people what they do is kind of odd and strange but if you're just around them you don't notice them because it's just almost a second nature so this was me just trying to detach myself from everything and almost and try to approach it with as fresh of eyes as i could now i love the performance I I have a fondness for everybody's performance, and if we were to break this down for hours and hours and hours and hours, I could probably get down to the bottom of why every individual character and actor, their shtick works for me. But at the end of the day, this is such a comfort watch to me in a weird way that I I can't honestly critique performances because i just enjoy them even the campy ones but y'all both know i love shitty movies we should really discuss the fact that uh we're not really gonna like give rose red a deep or a cut we are spending three whole episodes talking about this movie during Mm -hmm. the month of october the month of halloween okay Mm -hmm. we like this movie spoiler alert yes this is not a review. This is more like a, a fanboy slash fangirl session. <laughs> I don't know if you want me to want me to call it that or not. This is we love this, and not enough people know about it. So we've got to scream about how much we love it. So all y'all will know to watch it because you need to watch it. Like this is pretty much us being like, this is great. Um, here I'm laying it before you. Please do something with it. Um, because not enough people do anything with it, and we need more people to do stuff with it so we can get it on digital and get it on DVD. You're telling me there was enough praise behind Stephen King's The Shining miniseries that it got a physical release that's still coming out today, and this didn't? Come on. But again, I'll attribute that to it being 2001 when it came out. And it being not really well received at all, as opposed to the movie that came out the year or two before it, Storm of the Century. When you bring up Storm of the Century, I just remember about how much I I liked Storm of the Century, okay, but it wasn't my favorite. So I can kind of understand, this was around the time that he had a lot of miniseries going on, and some of them a lot of them weren't as well liked so by the time rose red rolled around i think people weren't watching them like they were when you first started them because they weren't really enjoying them as much and it's not an issue with stephen king so much as i think 
he makes them mm-hmm. for a certain type of audience who likes what he would like. And so he makes what he finds interesting or what in his nightmares entertained him or made him feel something. Because at the end of the day, he's a writer. So his objective is to make an, his audience feel something or to feel a type of way. And him, his way of conveying that is by telling these stories, whether it be screenplays or novels, what have you. So I think that it's just it's underrated for the fact that it's not your everyday person's going to enjoy this type of storytelling. And that's where he kind of, like it, his mini series kind of seemed to fall off as far as like being well received. And I mean, to piggyback off of that, you, you have this movie coming out in 2001. Think of what Stephen King's put out before then. He's basically rewritten the whole horror genre at this point. Um, every, Pretty much every movie he's made up to this point, whether it be good or bad, has pr- become an iconic figure in horror. The vampire in Salem's Lot, the outline of Carrie against the fire as she's destroying the gym, Christine, Cujo, um, The Shining. I, I get a lot of people have issues with Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. I think it's a great film, not a good adaptation, but the good adaptation really isn't that good (laughs) yeah so at this point in his career he really doesn't have to make anything that's 100 percent astounding but this is really good people should watch it and just be happy with what they get i would say one of the last things probably to discuss is the scene where kevin bollinger goes to rose red before anyone else does because he they kind of have this plan that they're gonna hide in he's gonna hide in rose red and kind of do an expose and miller has told him this is going to set up his whole career it's going to be a whole thing in the paper defraud humiliate the whole nine yards and kevin rolls up into rose red and this is the first time we see the house actively doing something creepy whenever he knocks on the door sukina answers and sukina i'll give the actress credit she she disturbs me. There's just something about her performance and something about her that is just creepy. Maybe it's just the fact that there is this lone caretaker of a place that has clearly not been taken care of at all. It's her eyes, I think. Her mm-hmm. eyes are just so wide open. And it doesn't appear to be a quirk. It doesn't appear to just be a quirk of her character. Like, if you look up Rose Red cast and you see, like, Mm -hmm. Tsukina's picture on IMDb, Mm -hmm. she looks Mm -hmm. just like that in real life. Oh. I I couldn't meet her. Like, some people have things about Sissy Spacek since Carrie. They couldn't do anything with her. I couldn't do anything with this lady because she terrified me as a child. One thing that I found a little frustrating about this is... Uh, Kevin is present for the lecture that Joyce gives about Rose Red. And during the lecture, as Joyce is talking, we receive flashbacks to these events that are actually happening. So all throughout that scene, which Kevin witnessed, we, the audience, are seeing pictures of Tsukina. And and yet when Kevin goes uh, to Rose Red and sees Tsukina, he doesn't recognize her. Now this is, of course, because he didn't see the flashbacks. Only we did. But it immediately makes me think, damn you, idiot, that's the dead lady. That's the dead lady. Run away. Okay, the the flashback sequence makes sense when you consider some people are psychics. So I would, I have a sneaking suspicion, like, as she was talking, Nick actually saw the flashback. I, I believe that that is true for a lot of the flashbacks, like when Steve... Mm-hmm. Uh, is approaching Rose Red and we see the flashback mm-hmm. of him as a child. I interpreted mm-hmm. that as Nick actually seeing that. You can see a lot of stuff through um, Nick's lens. I believe that's what he serves. He's basically the uh, flashback explainer and his people visualize things in his mind. Uh, he he sort of manifests them and that's in turn what we see. No, I agree 100% with that because a lot of the times things get explained via Nick asking those character questions, trying to get some clarification to what he witnessed or saw. And when he gets that clarification, we're getting clarification for it as well. Yes. So, so Kevin somehow loses Sukina, she disappears, and apparently he gets Macaulay Culkin in My Girl by some bees or something, and then just abruptly picked up 
into the air by something that unfortunately we never figure out what it is. It's a fun theater of the mind trick. Um, but when all this happens, Miller's trying to call him on this cell phone that is so 2000s. It's such a 2000 cell phone. And he's on the voicemail and you can hear Miller say, if you're there, pick up, pick up. And you hear it on the phone that is laying on the ground while whatever's happening to Bollinger. Um, and I just think it's so funny going back to the days when voicemails weren't a thing on phones, but answering machines were. And you could hear that if you're there, pick up. Or maybe that's just a continuity error and that was never a thing. I just thought it was funny. Yeah, no, it definitely, it was, and I'm so glad you made that reference to my girl, because if you didn't, I was going to, because as I was watching it, I was like, oh my gosh, Stephen King must really liked my girl. Bollinger really um, looks like a Culkin. <laughs> um, maybe that's my thing, because I have a, he I does. have a shameless crush on Macaulay Culkin, um, and he can do that, because I, I, I've heard opposition, namely every time I bring up my crush on Macaulay Culkin, or any Culkin. Um, Kieran is another one I really like. There's another one out there who was in Scream 4. Um, I don't like him, but I wouldn't say no. Let's just say that. If you're listening, I'm keeping my options open. Call me. Um, but <laughs> your odds aren't as great for your bro- uh, aren't as good as they are for your brothers. I think it's yes. a very strange choice how they made kevin uh disappear in this scene like you said it plays on the theater of the mind but we have him locked in this greenhouse type area and he starts to get swarmed by bees and i had actually misremembered this scene from my childhood i thought that he got consumed by bees right like swarmed all over his body stung to death but no that's not what happens he backs up to a tree and what seems to be saliva drops down onto his shoulder and then he looks up and gets this horrified uh, expression on his face and then he like gets pulled up into the ceiling and to my knowledge we never get to see what that was do we okay so in so... i i did a lot of soul searching for this um especially with the vision that steve has coming to rose red i think that Ellen is still alive. She is the only living person in the house. And yes. she's some sort of, clearly some sort of crazed monster. But she is the only one who's actually alive in the house. Because the psychic said she won't die if she keeps building the house. And so the house keeps building itself. So now her and the house are kind of in tandem. And later we kind of get this illusion that she's been living in the attic this whole time. But I do feel like she is a presence of this house. Um, where, where her, where she is and where the house is and the intermingling of that with ghosts is a bit unclear. But that's my, um, where we are in the story, that's my assumption that she's some sort of monster and, and in the thing, house. One thing that I do. I think that's important about Kevin's is you also have to remember this is still the first episode. One thing Stephen King loves to do is for you to not know the true form of the monster throughout the majority of the movie. He really likes those you constantly spending the movie trying to figure out what the fuck it even is. And it usually he does that sucks. So much. <laughs> yeah, it's usually a lot of build up for something that just doesn't really make much sense. Spider monster. Um you're like how and you never get you never get an he really loves to be like, This monster exists. No not a vague explanation of how it came to be, um, but past that, no, no real genuine explanations of how this even came to be or happened or got to this point. Um, he really loves to do those like gradual, if ever, like monster reveals. So I feel like that's why he set it up the way he did. That we don't see what took Kevin away um, is because it's one of those things he didn't want us to see yet because that's just what Stephen King does. He doesn't want us to know right off the bat who are monsters or whatever, because then that keeps us guessing of what should we look out for to happen. Like what is our signal that these characters are in danger? Cause we don't know what it looks like. We don't know all of its attributes or anything like that yet. So it kind of leaves it open to where anything can kind of happen at any point well, in time. I want to be very clear about something just in case I, I implied it. Uh, I take no issue whatsoever with them not showing the monster in this scene. I've said many times across the episodes that we've done so far that I love it when the monster is kept hidden. 
because it keeps the audience wondering and guessing, just like you said. But the nature of Rose Red being haunted, it seems, by the ghosts of vengeful humans, uh, and it being like this sort of greenhouse scenario, it seems strange to me that they would have him almost plucked up by some... What, what I imagine as being like this gross, fleshy monster clinging to the ceiling, almost like that, that episode of, of Doctor Who... Um, when they when they rebooted the series like it seemed like a strange choice uh and, and the fact that we never ever get to see what it was i i agree it adds this air of mystery like oh my gosh anything can happen but at the same time i'm thinking well yeah anything can happen so i should just not even bother to figure it out theater of the mind i i see in my head Whatever creature Ellen Rimbauer is, I see her just like haunched in a tree, like some sort of spider awaiting its prey, and then it kind of salivates on him and then pulls him up into the tree. If he had a budget now, it would probably look sort of akin to what the 2018 It movie did where it grabs Georgie. Sort of something akin to that with the same jerky sort of movements. Did you have something uh, that you imagined, Martha? Honestly, I always thought it was Ellen. Interesting. Genuinely, I always thought you know, she just because I always my understanding. Sorry, you said you like, said I, you said Ellen, and in my head I thought 1990s Ellen DeGeneres, and I was like, "Hi, I'm Ellen." <laughs> <laughs> The, when the she work, had her TV she, show and she came I, out as a lesbian. <laughs> the working title for this film was Ellen Degenerate. <laughs> like I, now that you put that in my mind, I'm now picturing Ellen on all fours with her head turned around backwards, looking down at him. Hi, I'm Ellen. <laughs> that explains why and she's so she mean on like set. Like a gecko, like a lizard, like a lizard, and she just wraps her up with her lizard tongue. Explains why everyone hates off. her now. Like still on. Yeah. She kills all the men and takes all the women Kevin. because she's lesbian. She's creating like a ghost harem. <laughs> <laughs> See, no, that's that's another thing that we'll talk about later on is how I feel about Ellen and Zucchina's relationship. Oh, it's very <laughs> we'll sapphic in the diary. It episode. is very sapphic. Oh, is Ooh. it? Do I need to read it? Ooh. I mean, it's nothing... <laughs> I feel like I need to read it now. It's nothing very... Well, she also says she never called her a servant. It was always my friend and then my sister. Um, so I feel like they were sapphic sisters. It's... I don't think where I am in the diary, it's ever explicitly stated that they do it. But there is an implied notion that there is a lot more going on with Ellen and Sukina. Yeah, than what we know. So the the last little bit of this episode is basically them coming up to the house and they're all gathered together and we kind of get their little final moments, little bit of foreshadowing. Annie has joined the group and she, right, right from Jump Street, she clearly has a little bit more power than everybody else and everybody's kind of off put by it. I, I really think it was ballsy that we built all the way up here and this is where the movie ends. Right when thing well, when the episode ends, right when things are getting good. Like you know, proverb proverbially good at the end of the first act. This movie follows this mini series, sorry, follows a perfect three act structure with three episodes. And I think that again might have been what was polarizing was that this whole first act is an hour and a half long, but with commercials is two hours long. I think it was fantastic how they did it because it definitely hooked you in because at this point you're really invested in the characters. You want to know what happens and you're like, what the fuck is this house going to do? Like, what's going on with this house? It raises a whole bunch of questions and answers basically none of them and really sets you up that you want to watch next week when that next part airs. Like, you've got to figure out what's going yeah, on. Yeah, it gives you the taste of it with Kevin going into the house and you just see little bits of it. And they're very um, aware of what they are showing you in the house and what you're seeing in terms of spirits in the house. Everything's really in shadow. You don't even see Sukina that much. Um, it's just a good first act. But the question I wanted to propose to you is, how do you guys think this is as a first episode? Like, did, did this make you want to watch more um, from this point? Say you had to wait another week to watch this and not knowing 
what else was happening. Would this make you want to watch more? Like from a today's angle. Yeah, most certainly. Um, yeah, no, the, it definitely would have made me, it, I would have felt the same way I did after watching the first episode of Lost. Like, I've got, like, I've got so many questions. I've got such a good setup for an enjoyable story. Like, I'm genuinely interested because it was nothing, like, super incredibly dark and twisted in this first episode. You got, like, a little taste, like a little sampling of it, um, of of what's to come. So you definitely were, were I feel like you would have been synced into getting those answers. Um, so for me, because I'm very much a character and story person, I would have been all in been like, yeah, there's no way I'm missing this. If I've got to do something, it's definitely getting taped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're taping it. I love it. <laughs> I th absolutely would be hooked by the end of this episode because we've had so much build up, so much exploration of the history of this house, and yet we haven't even properly seen it yet. And I understand that that could put a lot of people off but i really i really dislike that that's the case i think i've gone on this soapbox before but there's this pervasive idea in the film medium that if something isn't on screen it doesn't exist right you can't just talk about it you can't pan away from it you have to show it or for as far as the audience is concerned it, it doesn't happen and and to me i i hate that because one of the coolest things that I love in, in novels is the build-up that you get. You hear about a character, or you hear about a location, or a monster, or something. And you hear about it for chapter after chapter, for maybe an entire book or two before you ever see it. And then when you finally see it, it gives you the opportunity to have this enormous payoff. To me, that's what this episode is. It's the build-up. It, this episode is about Rose Red, but Rose Red isn't really in it. It's just telling you the history of the house, how dangerous it is, and you know the psychic activity of all these protagonists that we have and how it might spark something to go into the house. And it just keeps building and building and building until eventually you, as the audience, are thinking, what's going to happen when they get here? Because they've built it up so much, it really must be worth it. And to me, of course, I would be hooked at that point. I think the build-up is necessary, and I wish that more movies would do it. It's one of those. It's one of those good examples, like Stephen King mentioned, of not having to cram everything into a suitcase. You really do get to have a, for lack of a better term, a hour, a two-hour uh, first act, which is something you really couldn't do anyway. Now, could they probably do with a little bit more? showing not telling of some things uh, actually no i'm gonna say no on this one um because the way they were presenting it as a true to life these events really happened you you need a lot of telling um because it just just creates more layers and validation for what's going on yeah, it's weird. You mentioned show, don't tell. I was actually thinking that during the lecture scene as I was watching it. And I, I was wondering, why does this scene work so well for me? Because that's a conventional piece of wisdom is when you're writing, show, don't tell. Weirdly enough, I think that in movies, I like telling better. Something about it, just it lets me take my imagination where I want to take it rather than relying on the the movie to show me what's happening. I'd rather use my imagination. It's a fine line in relevancy, though, because if you have a character who's too telly and it doesn't blend well, you're going to notice it. Think Miss, Miss What's-Her-Face in Carnival of Souls, who owned the boarding house. She immediately goes into telling you about the place and how you can take a hot bath if you want, as many as you want. I'm not one to make a fuss about a thing like that. But in this movie... It reminds me a lot of the first season of Game of Thrones, which is ironic because I kind of fell out of Game of Thrones in the first season. You get people's names and then immediately you get like a whole little cliff bar of what their job is, what their family life is like, what their psychic power is, all these things, just like you do in the first season of Game of Thrones. Which uh, is so strange to me because that's been a common theme that i've heard of people with the first season of game of thrones mm -hmm. that they think it's too slow something crazy mm -hmm. important happens every single episode guys 
what what is fast to y'all hypothetical people that I'm bitching about right now? Like <laughs> a little boy. Oh, no 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 no. No. Okay. I'm not gonna well, do spoilers. I'll, I'll... I'm going to do spoilers for the yeah, show no, that's like no. 10 years old. Just ju- just go watch the first three seasons. But there is a character and then nothing in there after that. in Game of Thrones that has the same kind of build-up that I was talking about with Rose Red, and that's that's Tywin Lannister. In the books, we hear about him constantly, and everybody's afraid of him, but you don't really see him until like three-fourths of the way through. And so it, it really helps that build-up, just like the, the lecture scene and all of this first act helps the build-up with Rose Red. Yeah, it's just funny that for a movie that's clearly solely about a haunted house on paper with the advertising and everything, you don't even really see the house or really get into the house until the very end of the first episode, and then it goes off. Yeah, it definitely just sets an expectation of, of it kind of builds up on the lore of like this, let it speak for itself at this moment. But when it happens, like, you're not necessarily surprised that it's happening because you've been advised that things like this is not an odd occurrence for Rose Red. It really sets an expectation of, you know, this is what's happened before. Like, you know, now let's see what happens to our characters as they go in here and tr- try to charge the battery on a dead cell. And it gives the authors license to just let shit hit the fan. Because like Dylan said closer to the beginning of the episode, we are not playing that card of, is it haunted? Is it not haunted? Did they really see something, or are they crazy? Ooh, what's that in the shadows? No. This place is haunted, and some crazy shit's gonna go down. So, buckle up. Like, I love that we get to skip that part, because we have had so much build-up and just say, no. This house is the, the final boss, and you're gonna fight it. I hope you're prepared. And the whole first episode's gonna be about this final boss. They really do stress the importance of you're kind of, these people are going into the belly of the beast, pretty much. Um, can't think of another Haunted House movie. That's the case. Even movies like House on Haunted Hill. It's just about, it, 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 you still have people thinking, oh, I'm seeing stuff, or oh, she's crazy, oh, she's schizophrenic. The whole, the whole nine yards. That's never an issue here. People know the house is going to play tricks on them, and they're going to see things. Haunting of Hill House, the Netflix series, did the same thing. We, I mean, we have constant flashbacks to the children living in the house, but we don't actually see them return to the house until much later. Yeah, and it just does such an incredible build-up. But before we wrap things up, does anyone have anything they want to bring to the table? I was just saying, I don't um, have another tangent or anything like that. I'm just super excited to talk about what happens from here because we've really laid the groundwork so far, and it's just the what happens from that groundwork is just even better. So oh yeah, it's gonna it's it. gonna be fun. What's coming next? I guess this is our little section where we are grossly foreshadowing what's gonna happen, like that like the movie we're talking about. Ooh. You're not going to believe what's going to happen. It's it's definitely going to be something. If only you could see what's in store. I think we've covered most things uh, in fairly fairly extensive and needless detail in some cases. Uh, I'm just, I'm excited for part two. Me too. I'm excited to see it. But if no one has anything else, I guess that's where we'll wrap this show up for today. Remember guys, come back with us next week as we take a look at the second part of Rose Red. Um, remember to follow us on our social medias, Twitter and Instagram at DeepHorrorPod, and you can also email us recommendations at DeepCutsOfHorror at gmail.com. Make sure you give us a follow on Spotify, Apple Music. If you have Apple Music, go ahead, give us a five-star rating if you like the episode, if you like the show, and then go ahead and hit the review button and give us a nice review. Um, we do post those on our socials every now and then because we like give thanks and credit to those who give it to us. Is there anything else you guys want to add before we sign off, before I edit stuff out? Have a good October, everyone. It's one of the best months of the year, especially if you like spooky stuff. So I hope you make the most of it. Yep, and we're going to be here all month. And thanks for joining us this October. I mean, this is going to be fun. We're all going to spend October in Rose Red. What a way to do it. (laughs) 